There, meeting is now recording. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome to Explore Careers in Government Jobs with Career Force. Today is March 23rd, 2021, and I'm Liz Jennings, Employer Engagement Specialist. So glad to have all of you on the call today. Uh, today's guests that we'll be hearing from are only a snippet of all of the possible paths for employment within public service jobs. So we will be hearing from the Minnesota Consortium of Human Resource Managers Association, Minnesota Counties, thank you, Minnesota Counties of Human Resource Managers Association, the United States Postal Service, uh, U.S. Federal Forest Service, um, the State of Minnesota, and U.S. Census Bureau. Um, and then I'll be uh, covering all of the other job links for different types of government careers at, towards the end of the session. You know, I wanted to point out that a high number of, a uh, high percentage of Minnesota residents, adults work in a government in some form of another. This is from Deeds Labor Market, uh, data site. And it said um, for 2019, I believe the statistics are 14.9%, uh, almost 15% of people um, in Minnesota work for some form of government. Um, only 1.2% are federal government. You know, a subset of that is the U.S. Postal Service. 3.6 are state government, like myself. Um, and, you know, state government also includes education. So I believe that number includes um, things like the University of Minnesota, um, but then also local government. 10.1% of Minnesota residents work in some form of local government, whether that's county or city. Um, all of our public school teacher, teachers, those are city workers. Um, so really, it's it's a much bigger percentage um, and much larger opportunity than what we um, ever think about. So first up, I'd like to invite Christina Cohen. Um, she's a human resources manager for Fillmore County in Minnesota, but she's vice president of the association called Macrame, and so she'll be able to explain to you what that is all about. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Liz. Welcome, everyone. Um, and yes, Macrame does not refer to arts and crafts, though a lot of people like to think it does. Uh, Macrame is the Minnesota County Human Resources Management Association, and it involves all 87 counties throughout the state. And we all work together in collaboration for best practices, for, um, you know, just collaboration on recruiting is one of those areas and actually one of those areas that we spend a lot of time on. So if you'll go to the next slide for me, Liz, um, first wanted to just start with a lot of people don't realize what their county government does. And so why would I think of getting a looking for a job in county government when I'm not even sure what they do? And I'm not a read it to you kind of person, but if you look through this list, everything from your county roads that get plowed in the winter, maintained in the other types of seasons, um, from your building permits, if you're in rural areas, you know, if you have feedlots and those things or more metropolitan areas, when you're building, you're looking at your building permits and sites, but also those um, safety net pieces that we all think about a lot, our financial assistance, daycare assistance, food and health assistance, those are all managed by your local county government. People like to think of those as being state and federal, and a lot of the dollars may come from there, but that's all managed on your local county level, as well as your local child support um, and child protection. Those are all county run things. Um, and for those of you out there that are veterans, I'm gonna touch on a piece in a little bit that you should be especially aware of for some unique opportunities to you being a veteran. Um, so yeah, and again, law enforcement and all of those different things, all the way down to prosecuting your local crimes. So county governments really do touch the real life that we all live in, in our local areas. So um, Liz, can you go to the next slide for me, please? You know, a lot of, in the news over the last several years, you know, I think government 
as a whole has really gotten kind of a bad name. We see a lot of the divisiveness on the federal level, um, and that really kind of turns us off to why would I want to be a cog in that particular machine. County government is very, very different in that you are making an impact in your local area. I live in Fillmore County. The work that I do affects me, my neighbors, my family. It is very much right here where I live, where my actions take effect. And that's a wonderful thing to be able to be a part of, to be able to actually see the difference you're making in your own communities. Um, it's very gratifying. So also on the average, public sector employment has a much higher job security level than private sector. Um, at, in a previous lifetime, I did human resources in the private sector in areas such as hospitality, hotels, and even manufacturing. And those can be feast and famine industries where they're hiring, 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 and then the next minute they're laying off, laying off, laying off. The public sector is very different because every position is scrutinized a lot more, um, mostly because they're paid for by taxpayer dollars. And so we take a lot of time to find out whether or not hiring a position would be a good use of taxpayer dollars. And so when we do bring a position on, that position is intended for a very long time. And government center, sectors do enjoy a much higher job security rate and much lower unemployment rate than many of their counterpart type industries in the, pub, in the private sector. So that's a great reason. Also, public sector has wonderful benefits. Um, you know, we've had a lot of things that are big in the news these days, retirement being a huge one. For many years now, it's been, I don't know if I can be able to afford to retire. Um, the public sector, at least in counties, uh, counties and cities have what's called PERA, and that stands for the Public Employee Retirement Association. And that's almost like your old pension plans. For those of you that remember pension plans, um, it's it's a wonderful, long-standing benefit package. So public sector also offers incredible paid time off plans. Um, and then of course, in the public sector, there's a federal program called the student loan forgiveness. If you're in a position where you went to college and you have student loan debt, um, there is a program that you can only be a part of if you work in the public sector that will potentially reduce and forgive a portion of your student loans. <clears throat> so they're all really great reasons to consider working in the public sector. The other things, of course, is scheduling. Public sector is starting to more and more enjoy a lot more telecommuting. Uh, public sector does enjoy a lot of flex time, or if I work long this day, maybe I can leave early another day. So that helps with that work-life balance that's so important to all of us. And we enjoy things like, you know, let's say my my grandkids, because I'm at that age of grandchildren, maybe have a concert at three o'clock on Thursday. So I ask my boss if I can work a little bit later on Tuesday and leave on Wednesday. And those things are much more prevalent in the public sector to be able to flex out that time. So that scheduling for work-life balance really is something that is very special and, and welcomed in the public sector. And then, of course, I promise to talk about you veterans. If you are a veteran, public sector employment, there is a leg up for you when you are trying to apply because we are paid by taxpayer dollars. And first and foremost, any veterans out there, I would like to very much thank you for your service. Um, I'm actually the president of my own Veterans of Foreign Wars Auxiliary myself, so I'm a huge supporter of veterans, so thank you. But for veterans in the public sector, when you are applying for a position, you will automatically receive additional points in your scoring because of your service. What that does is it helps give you a much stronger possibility of getting into that all important interview. You know, much like the private sector, you know how these work. You apply for a position, you need to get it into that interview group where you can then talk about your skills and abilities and sell yourself for that position and get information on whether that position is a good fit for you. For you veterans, we try and make that process easier for you through what's called veterans preference points. And those are automatic 
as long all you need is a DD-214 when you apply and you are automatically guaranteed those points for you. So that's another way to help you get into that public sector employment. So we strongly always encourage veterans to apply for public sector jobs. Not to say that if you're not, you shouldn't. The other piece that most people think of is what kind of jobs are available. Uh, and the jobs really run the entire gamut. Everywhere from custodial staff, um, front desk people, that the office support person, to we have um, class A drivers that of course plow our roads, maintain our roads. We hire nurses, we hire attorneys, we hire social workers, uh, you know, dispatchers. Not all positions in the public sector require a degree. Probably a majority of the positions you see up here in front of you don't require an advanced degree. Our office support, our custodial, our property appraisers, jailers and deputies, dispatchers, um, you know, many of these positions do not require any kind of advanced degree. So, you know, we really have everything from no degree up to, you know, our attorneys and our civil engineers. So, if you go ahead and go forward, the question then becomes, how do I find these jobs? Because, you know, a lot of times they're not in the places you might look. I've put some recommendations on here. You would be able to find jobs from pretty much any county in the state by looking at these various sites. Um, the Association of Minnesota Counties, I see I put a colon instead of a what I wanted there, my apologies. Um, that actually is a place that all counties use to post all positions. So you can look by county specific or you can look by position type. Uh, most counties also have a Facebook page. So I encourage you to look up your county or your neighboring county um, for those pieces. Some do still go in the local paper. You can always call your, your local HR. And I put the link on here for macrame because that link right there will get you directly to a member listing from every county in the state and who their HR rep through macrame is for specific questions. So there's a lot of ways to apply. I really encourage you to take advantage of it. We are always looking for people dedicated to public service, people who wanna make a positive impact in where they live and work. Um, I'm very passionate about it. So I would be happy to talk to anyone as well. Um, Liz, I'm more than happy for you to give out my email address as well, or you can find me on the macrame site if you wanna to talk to me directly about questions. Great, um, you know, Christy, there was one question that came in privately to me about how the point system works. Do all counties use a point system? I think I believe, you know, Ramsey County here does. Right, so all public sector positions um, in that first reading of applications generally, we're required to use a 100 point system. And the reason for that is because of those veterans preference points. So all counties do utilize that point system. Um, the very, very basic requirements, you know, the bare minimum requirements would get you 70 points, which is what you need to at least get past that level. And that's because of the state statutes with regard to veterans preference points. Um, the way I know the way Fillmore County does it, we do those veterans preference points when we rate the applications. And then once we have our interview group, then everyone starts at zero. So that's how we do it. A lot of counties do it that way. Some do give it at interview, but most give it in that first phase. Is there a preference or uh, if someone has worked in state and county government, I'm sorry, if someone has worked in federal government, mm -hmm. um, is are there points for getting them into a county job? You know, is there any sort of uh, extra points given to that? Well, that's kind of an interesting question. And actually, I or my first public sector job was with TSA when they were first rolling out after 9-11. So talk about an interesting intra entrance into the public sector. Um, it may or may not give necessarily those basic points. What it does do though, is if you have that federal, state, city, um, a local municipality, any of those type of public sector things, of course, we're gonna see that as a benefit because there are some things that make public sector unique and you will have some experience with that. 
that being said, you know, we hire a lot of people that have never worked in the public sector also. So I don't want people that haven't worked in any public sector before to be discouraged from applying. We absolutely look on both ends of that. Great, thank you. And one last question, yes or no. Um, under veterans preference, do spouses get any preference? It depends. Um, there is a credit for spouses of either deceased veterans or disabled veterans. Um, and every county can get you a veterans preference form. The other thing that I would encourage if you have questions is to get a hold of your local veteran services officer. Great. Thank you. I'm afraid we have to go on now. Thank you so much, Christina, for Thank being you. here today and talking a little bit more about county services. So that's that's great you. information. I'd like to move now on to uh, Michael Goldbiss with U.S. Census Bureau. Michael, are you on? Uh, I am indeed, Liz. Thank you. Yay, we can hear you. <laughs> Fabulous. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I actually represent a very small agency with about 5,000 permanent employees that has a tremendous heft in terms of what we do. First of all, um, I, like many people who are speaking today, uh, would like to thank all veterans who are out there, because we thank you for your service. Uh, we also have veterans preferences because we are a federal government agency. And uh, we share something with veterans, and that is we work for us. We're all employed by us if we work for the federal, state, and local government. And that is something that we have to bear in mind when we talk about working for uh, the governments at any of the levels that we work with. The Census Bureau is the agency that measures America's people, places, and economy. And uh, we, in this particular instance, are looking for people who we hire locally to work locally so that you can make an impact for the community and join our team today. But I know Liz at the end is going to be talking about jobs that you can find at the federal level and at the local level. And the Census Bureau hires all the time uh, at the federal level and at the local level. Uh, we have a variety of uh, census surveys. We don't only conduct the decennial survey, which is uh, conducted every 10 years. We also conduct the American Community Survey, the Quarterly Services Survey, and in particular, the American Housing Survey that I'm going to be addressing today. So we have about 130 surveys and programs each year that are the foundation on which public spending takes place. So all of the programs that we actually talk about are established on the basis of the numbers that you help us collect when you work with us in the census surveys and we process and then share publicly with everybody else, understanding that the information that we collect is never shared individually, but shared collectively. And that is, we respect privacy, and I will be talking about that somewhat later on. Next slide, please. So the American Housing Survey is sponsored by the Department of Housing and Urban Development and is conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau. And that's something else that we do. We work with all other agencies of the federal government and many times agencies of state and local government uh, to provide comprehensive data on important statistics. So when you think of the numbers that you get in terms of, for example, how many people live in the country, you know that that is something that the Census Bureau provides. But we also provide data on housing and demographic characteristics. So we provide the information that congressional staff, policy analysts, program managers, the people in counties, cities, and local jurisdictions use to document housing conditions and costs to assess housing needs. So when we talk about how many people have affordable housing, how many people need housing, what kind of housing we have, that's information that we collect on behalf of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And the American Housing Survey is conducted every two years between May and September 
in odd numbered years. And this year it's going to be conducted in the metropolitan area uh, among men, others of uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul and some other areas in Minnesota. And that's why we are so interested in you considering employment with us for the American Housing Survey, but also the American Community Survey and many other surveys that will take place this year. Next one, please, Lewis. The field representative positions that we have available uh, have a salary range that you see up there of 15 to 21 uh, dollars, almost 22 dollars, which uh, have a difference based on the counties where we hire. There is a 10 percent night differential and there is a reimbursement based on the federal rate of miles uh, driven. So you have flexible hours. They vary based on the survey. But you, if you live in any of the counties listed, which go for include Anoka, Carver, Sago, Cottonwood, Crow Wing, Dakota, Hennepin, Hubbard, Isanti, Lesur, Ramsey, Scout, Sherburn, Washington, Wright, and Winona, we are interested in having you apply for our positions. Your duty location would be where you live, and most likely you would work where you live. But if there's work available in neighboring counties, you would be invited uh, because there is a car requirement that you would be invited to perhaps work uh, in, in other locations. So we hire, as I said, all the time throughout Minnesota and at the federal level, we also hire all the time. Next slide, please. We have some basic requirements because we uh, require a background check you have to be a U.S. citizen. You complete an assessment and a mock and structured job interview. You have to have six months of general experience, but there is no basic education requirement. Uh, you have to be at least 18 years old. You have to have a valid driver's license. You have to have an insured and working vehicle. And this background check isn't necessarily one where you would think of going into getting a security clearance uh, to have top secret um, clearance for military secrets. But uh, because we work with what we call personally identifiable information, which includes uh, information such as your social security, includes social security numbers and information that would be associated with dates of birth and so on, we as census workers swear for life never to reveal the information that we collect. So any information that you collect during an interview, you swear not to share even if you stop working for the census. And this is a serious responsibility. And if you don't meet that responsibility, if for example, uh, they, you would lose that, you would not, um, you would uh, perhaps be caught releasing that information, you could go to prison for three years and be punishable with a, a financial fine. So uh, we are very um, concerned with the privacy of U.S. citizens. We invite you to request an application by calling 1-800-865-634-6384, I'm sorry, extension 15, or contact us at the email at chicago.recruiting at census.gov. And I will also provide this with, our, uh, with my personal email where you can reach me. And uh, we are always open to questions about our positions. Our positions are positions that are temporary, but they are ongoing because if you are part of one survey, it's likely that you will work for another survey. And what uh, is important is that you have a great degree of leeway in terms of working part time. And uh, working for the federal government is something that is a tremendous asset for future employers. I have found that because I have always worked for the federal government in one capacity or another ever since I went to school. And that is something that I take great pride in because as I said, we too serve and we too work for all of us. And with that, I would close and I would like to say that all of what we do as members of the US Census Bureau is in service of getting information that we collect and that we share. And if you would go one back, Liz, please, there's one thing that we really want to emphasize, and that is uh, at this time in 
Hennepin and Ramsey counties in particular, we are encouraging bilingual applicants, uh, particularly who speak Spanish and Hmong, to apply. We have a particular need for bilingual applicants. Any bilingual applicant always should be encouraged and we encourage you to apply because languages are assets when you go and present census information and you present the census and the questions that are then given during the uh, application. Uh, I will also post uh, a brief uh, YouTube uh, segment that shows you what a field representative does. And I invite you to visit our webpage and our information so that you can familiarize yourself with these opportunities. But as I said, we serve ourselves, we serve the citizens of the country, and we are grateful for your attention. Thank you, Liz. Do you have any so, questions uh, for me? Michael, with 30 seconds left, can yes. you briefly answer what does six months of general experience mean? It means basically any experience where you have had a job of record. Okay. Be that and in then, high school or wherever. Yes. Sure. And then a couple of people said that they had worked as enumerators either in 2010 or 2020. Um, does that factor into consideration in applications? Yes, please make sure you list that because prior employment is very important, especially because you've had a prior background check. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. That's great. And, you know, multiple people have been sending me some of the similar questions. So uh, all of that really helps. Thank you so much. And I will uh, quickly post my email uh, right down here. Great. Thank you for being on the call today. This is fantastic. Thank you um, so much. I'd like to move over now and uh, invite Tashi Lama of the United States Postal Service to present. Tashi, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Welcome. Liz? Thank you. Go uh, ahead. First of all, um, welcome everyone. Um, on behalf of the United States Postal Service, I would like to welcome everyone and then congratulate uh, you on being here. Um, uh, this is one of the initial steps, but this will take you to a uh, or the step towards the employment. Um, okay, can we go to the next slide? As you all know, United States Postal Service. When we reach out to people to ask, "What do you, uh, 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 what do you have as in perception of U.S. Postal Service?" Uh, they always go, uh, um, "The the agency that delivers the mail." But uh, to get more into it, um, uh, uh, we call it. We have a different, like the Postal Service itself is a different world. As you can see, um, if you want to find out more about like, okay, uh, what RCA or tractor trailer operator or the sales, um, uh, sales careers or the uh, uh, OIE does, the uh, operation industrial engineer does, then you can have video out there. But uh, just to let you know that Postal Service itself has a lot of uh, uh, different crafts and then positions uh, within the uh, um, US Postal field. Next slide, please. And I happy, I'm happy to announce that, like, okay, we are hiring for over 200 position right now. All of these are entry level position, uh, which means that it's a non career position for the most part. And then, as you can see, there are career position. So, um, non career position, uh, we have we have opening right now for PS email processing clerk. Uh, mail handler assistant, city carrier assistant, rural carrier associate, and assistant rural carrier. Uh, the difference between the uh, uh, PSE and um, PSE mail processing clerk and mail handler assistant and the rest of the other craft out there is um, PSE and mail handler assistant jobs are indoor job in compared to C uh, city carrier assistant, rural carrier associate, or assistant rural carrier. Uh, these are the outdoor um, uh, delivering mail either by um, walk or uh, or to drive in. So these are the position that we are offering right now, um, especially within the Twin Cities. And then uh, um, 
throughout the uh, um, Minnesota state. Uh, on top of that, we are also offering position right now, tractor trailer operators. We are like looking for 40 plus tractor trailer operator in order to apply for that job. You have to have a, uh, uh, commercial driver license a, and then has been driving for a tractor, uh, for at least a year. And we have our labor custodial job. This is um, a housekeeping job. You need to take another test. Um, occupational health nurse as well. We are trying to recruit one OHN um, for the postal service for the main office uh, in downtown Minneapolis. So these are the job. And then I just want to briefly touch what Tashi, the job before we does. move on, um, can sure. you just... Uh, Re-explain for us, what's the difference between a non-career and a career position? So non-career position are the position that you come in as a non-career employee, which means that you are not entitled to a federal benefits right away once um, until you became career or uh, converted to a career position. So uh, postal service, like I said, it has a, uh, it's itself a different role. It has a, its uh, different um ways of doing stuff uh non-career positions we only offer uh four hours of pto uh which is paid time leave and then the uh, uh health benefit non-career health benefit so you start as a non-career employee you you do your part um eventually uh once a senior employee career employee retires or uh, uh um reloc relocate relocates or separates from the job, then eventually a non-career employee is placed to a career position. The duration usually takes about a year and year and a half to get to a career position. Does that answer your question, Liz? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So starting with the PSC mail processing clerk, can you Oops. go back? Oh yeah. So you have a PSC mail processing clerk work in a fast paced environment at all times. They sort mail by hand or machine and work mostly at night. Millions of mail piece are processed on a daily basis. So this job is good for someone who likes to stay busy. Uh, mail handler assistants are on their feet. Most of their shift moving mail containers from point A to point B, loading trucks and belts, pushing, lifting, labeling, and scanning. This is the most physically demanding position at mail processing. CD carrier assistants are alternative for regular letter carriers who deliver and collect mail on foot or by vehicle in varying weather conditions. A position that works both indoor and outdoor in all weather. Uh, CD carrier assistants often lock 10 miles or more a day between walking and driving. Rural carrier associate are versatile helping driver mail to rural customers, selling stamps and other products and helping out whatever they can. Um, this is a position that is often referred to a post office on wheels. The job includes driving and take place in all weathers, both indoors and outdoors. Um, lastly, as assistant rural carriers primarily load and deliver packages on Sundays, and observe holidays. They may produce, uh, sorry, they may provide uh, full day delivery assistance on Saturdays. The job includes driving and work it is performed indoors and outdoors in all type of weather. Um, so these are the entry level position that I was talking about. For other job like the uh, tractor trailer operator, there is a certain requirement. Um, for level custodial, there is a requirement as well. So for tractor trailer operator, like I said before, you need to have a CDL, a driver's license, labor custodian, you need to um, um, take another test before you, uh, you apply for this job. And then the um, occupational health nurse, you need to be a registered nurse in the state of Minnesota in order to apply for this kind of job. Uh, for slide, uh, Tashi, for some of the positions, um, do you have to have a, a physical with a doctor to, uh, to apply? Is that any part of it? I did not quite no. get the question. Do you have to have a physical with your uh, with your doctor um, for a post office position? Uh, for the non. Uh, career position, the entry level ones are you need you should be able to uh, lift up to 70 pounds physically. Okay. Okay. 
Great, that helps. Thank you. Okay. Next slide, please. So this all talks about the career benefits um, that we have, uh, the career employees benefits. Um, like I said before, it won't uh, be effective unless you made to a, a career position. So these are all the benefits that we Sorry about that. Uh, that we currently have, uh, and we offer for as a uh, as for the U.S. Postal Service. Um, does anyone have any question in regards to this? Okay. No, uh, not right now. All right. So this is where I want to touch base uh, on. These are the uh, uh, steps for the application process. Um, so when we usually talk about the job or like, you know, when you're applying for a job, uh, what are the things that people have on mind? Oh, I need to have a good things on my resume or I need to uh, uh, do a good job on interview. Guess what? We, uh, as a postal service, we do not require any of those. Uh, you do not have to have a, like, you know, fantastic resume or like you do not have to have to go through the interview process. This is, uh, the reason why we we started doing this is to uh, expedite our hiring process. So we have an application process, which is similar to your resume, but uh, this talks more about like you know your five years of residency, five years of uh, uh, em employment history, and then uh, your general eligibility questions, um, uh, which means that you uh, the general eligibility, which means that you need to uh, uh, be either a United States citizen or a permanent resident in order to apply for a postal service job. Um, you need to physically stay in the U.S. for at least five years. So these are the things that, uh, that, that is on the application portal. So once you submit your application, they will send you a, a, uh, the, um, um, the system will automatically generate an acknowledgement letter and uh, would request you to uh, take a virtual entry assessment test. So VEA, is basically based on the craft or the position that you're applying for. So if you're applying for mail handler assistant position, at the same time you see mail processing clerk, you apply for both. So you need to take the both tests. Uh, both, both tests are really, really easy. Um, it's more like an assessment where you talk about like, you know, what are the things that you need to uh, consider uh, um, uh, what are the uh, 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 things that you need to consider? And then what are, uh, um, like, there are some general questions, like, um, I just lost my train of thought, sorry about that. Uh, uh, general questions, like, uh, if you find something on the floor, what you should be doing, um, most likely you'll be reporting it to the uh, supervisor, like, you know, your coworkers lagging. What you need to do there will there are multiple uh, type of multiple choice question at the same time some of the um, are like you just look at the two different numbers and then make sure whether it has it's a match or it's an error so these are the thing um, that's on that question and then the uh, VEA usually takes about like 40 minutes up to 40 minutes uh, shouldn't be taking lo no longer than 40 minutes. Once you are done with that, you need, uh, in order to uh, get the job, you need to uh, have a score of at least 70. So once you do that, then like, okay, based on this um, score, they will send you the conditional job offer and inaki invitation. Conditional job offer, um, um, you have conditional job offer and inaki invitation, you have three days to complete that. Um, and then once that's through, uh, you will get an email from our one of the uh, subject matter expert uh, scheduling you for the um, fingerprint and I-9 paperwork. So once that's through, and then you will get an email from our orientation department. So some of the things that needs to remember is like, okay, our application onboarding process used to take about three months, but now uh, since we uh, eliminate some of the steps, so it can take up to 28 days, 28 days, not necessarily it means that it will take 28 days. Um, so these are a couple of like the uh, email addresses that correspond 
So if you receive an email from this uh, email addresses, then please uh, look look at it. For some reason, some of our email directly goes to the spam folder. We do not know why we are still looking at it. Um, so when you apply for a postal service job, you need to look into that. Look, look into your spam folder as well. And then um, some of the people things that like, okay, once they complete the NACI and then like, you know, they are waiting for a result and they, they didn't got their background result. It's because like, okay, in order to run the background test by our inspection service, you need to have a NACI and a fingerprint. Next slide, please. And we've got about one minute left, Tashi. Okay, these are just a general requirement. Um, uh, you need to be at least like 18 or older uh, in order to apply for a postal service job, or you can be 16 years old, but with the high school diploma, you can still apply for a job. Yeah, regardless whether you're a uh, green card holder or a uh, citizen, you can apply for the job. Um, so you need to be able to uh, pass a background check, physically stay in the United States for five years, like I said before, and then uh, safe driving record if you're applying for a driving position. Next slide, please. Um, so in, uh, in order to apply, you can just go in usps.com slash careers, or you can just contact me if you are like stuck at the application or if you have any other questions. Great, that's uh, that's really good. Thank you. Um, we do have some questions, unfortunately, though, I really do need to go on. So um, feel free, Tashi, to um, answer some of the questions maybe that you see in the chat or if people have uh, emailed them directly to you. And I really do appreciate you being on here um, to talk about all of the positions, you know, and I know that they're open statewide, right? Not just yes. in Minneapolis, but all over. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. I'd like to now invite Paula Hof with uh, the Forest Service, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Paula, are you there? We're going to give her a moment to unmute. Here we go. I'll unmute you. Okay. There, Paula. Yep. I'm sorry. I was I was heading out the gate there. Um, <clears throat> Thank you so much, Liz, for having me. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Paula Hoff, and I'm the Administrative Operations Specialist with the Chippewa National Forest. Um, we're part of the USDA Forest Service. Um, part of what we do, um, what our mission is, is caring for the land and serving the people. We help sustain our country's natural resources for future generations. Um, I did put on there um, the link to the US Forest Service uh, jobs and I think uh, Liz you I think you did you put a little uh, link there too anyway um what I'm here today if you want to move move forward to the next slide please Liz oh there we go um <clears throat> I was going to talk a little bit about the Chippewa National Forest um we are located in the heart of northern Minnesota um it's a celebration of seasons culture and environment uh, the Chippewa National Forest is the first national forest established east of the Mississippi in 1908 and is home to more lakes and wetlands than any other national forest. Um, it was originally known as the Minnesota National Forest and the name has changed was changed in 1928 to honor the original inhabitants. Um, the forest boundary encompasses about 1.6 million acres with more than 600,000 acres ma we are managed uh, directly by the the Chippewa National Forest. Um, within our forest, we have three districts, uh, one in Walker, Minnesota, one in Deer River, Minnesota, and one in Black Duck, Minnesota. Next slide, please. Um, today, I'm here to talk about uh, temporary employment. Um, we have uh, some job openings that are happening right now for the, for the summer and for fall. Um, our temporary hiring program allows individuals to get real world experience alongside resource professionals. Um, many of the permanent employees uh, started out as temporary employees and were hired on as permanents. Um, we're hiring for both uh, summer and fall. We're hiring forestry technicians, and these are temporary uh, uh, 1039 appointments is what they're called. Um, a 1039 is used uh, for seasonal work 
It means you, you'll work um, less than uh, 1,040 hours of duty. Um, you have additional 680 hours of uh, additional training hours in the first year of the appointment and up to 80 hours uh, each subsequent uh, year. The good, what's neat about the, the uh, 1039 appointment is um, you can be non-competitively rehired for the same position that next year. So um, you can come in and work, work the summer, work the fall, and then um, uh, be asked to come back next year without having to reapply. Um, we are also recruiting qualified veterans under the Veterans uh, Recruitment Appointment, the VRA. Next slide, please. These are the two positions um, that we're hiring. Uh, we have for, for the forestry technicians, we have a recreation and they basically, uh, you'll maintain campgrounds, rec sites, uh, you do, you know, you do the cleanup, you make sure that the, the uh, campers are in compliance, um, you do fee collection. Um, as you can see, other duties, you interact with the public, um, use equipment, tools, hammers, cordless drills, lawnmowers, brush, saw, uh, weed trimmers, um, <clears throat> and even drive in an ATV or a pickup with a trailer. Um, we also have another uh, forestry technician, and that is for uh, timber and silviculture. Um, it applies silviculture prescriptions and marking guides to designate timber harvest. So you'll be actually working um, with the uh, the timber folks, um, uh, preparing, uh, traversing harvest unit boundaries, uh, road locations, um, performs resource works in other areas such as timber uh, stand thinning, pruning, inspecting wildlife uh, contracts. Um, so that's what that's the two positions that we. We have available um, for this summer. Um, next slide. If you're interested in applying for these positions, there's a link below to um, the Chippewa National Forest Employment, uh, our site, and it's a public site and it actually has all the information um, that you would need to, uh, to apply for these jobs. Um, I posted the outreach there and once the job opens, which they'll be opening um, on the 25th of March, and it will it will be open for seven days, um, and then um, <clears throat> once I get that, once the job uh, opens on the 25th, I will put that link directly to that uh, to the link to USA Jobs where you would need to apply. Um, I'd be happy to uh, if you need assistance or have any questions. Uh, please contact me. For the veterans out there, we do not have to go through the hiring uh, process uh, through USA Jobs. It's a direct hire authority. So um, you just need to provide me with a resume and a list of references and send it to that email that uh, on the screen here. And then I will get in touch with you. If anybody has any questions, please um, feel free. My telephone number is there and my email is there. Paula, uh, is there housing available for seasonal workers? You know, at this this point in time, there is no, we do not have, because of COVID, we do not have housing available. So you would have to find your own um, housing. Uh, I, I would imagine that that's not going to change even into the fall and winter. Um, you know, it really depends on the COVID. But at this point in time, you would uh, have to... Um, find your housing. And we have positions, like I said, in Black Duck, Minnesota, Walker, Minnesota, and Deer River, Minnesota, which are, um, Walker and Black Duck are fairly close to Bemidji. So there there are, you know, we're a bigger city. I live in Bemidji, um, city of, uh, city of 14,000. Um, so there would be, uh, you know, housing available there and drive within drivable distance. Um, the Deer River, Positions, uh, Grand Rapids would probably be the the, the nearest larger um, town. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you know, after uh, being in my house all winter, being outside really sure seems appealing. <laughs> Ab absolutely, and you know what? If you love if you love this type of work, this is a good way to get your foot in the door. Um, I've worked for the government for almost thirty years now, and um, and I, it, it's just a wonderful opportunity. Sure. Yeah. 
thank you. Thank you for thank being you. on the call. This has been really helpful, you know, and, I, and at first when I was organizing this session, I didn't even consider some of the forest service. So I'm so glad you're here. Well, and you know, the, the forest service overall that we are always hiring and on that front screen, there is a, there's a link to, um, to the forest service website and, um, there's more job information there, but, um, yeah, my job today is to, to, to pitch those jobs for the Chippewa. So we, and we'd love to have you. Great. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about hiring in the state of Minnesota. I'm going to ch just check that Katie, my presenter, wasn't able to show up. Katie, are you here? I'm guessing not. She was having um, computer problems. So she said she wasn't going to be able to um, make it. We've had a couple of uh, state of Minnesota recruiters join us for the you know, over the past 12 months. So I had some slides that I would just share with you. Um, state employment breakdown by agency is, um, is really kind of all over the place. You know, human services is the largest department of human services with, uh, around 19%. These were numbers from 2017. So I don't know how it's changed. Deed, the agency that I work with has. 1300 employees with about 4%, um, tra Department of Transportation, 15%, Department of Corrections, Minute, Public Safety. We all have, um, you know, a couple thousand employees. With, with state benefits, um, they are pretty generous. You know, there's leave time, a vacation, sick, 11 paid holidays, you know, great health and dental insurance, um, you know, pre-tax benefits of any sort, you know, the, the health savings accounts or the um, uh, dependent care, F FSA, I believe it is, um, you know, and different retirement programs. You know, for every single department, they have their own department careers webpage. So no matter where you're, you know, if you're thinking about whether it's um, Department of Transportation or Department of Natural Resources or Revenue or Human Services, um, you know, you can just do a search on Minnesota.gov, m.gov, um, and then the Department and Careers, and you'll be able to get to those sites. And they can describe all of the open openings that they have and some of the benefits of working for their particular um, department. But for all of the positions, um, go to min.gov slash careers, and I'm going to type it into the chat right now, and then cl click on search for jobs now for external applicants. You know, register as a new user to create your own profile in job search, and at that point, it will ask you to upload you know, your your experience, same your previous jobs, your certifications that you have, and then you can use that to apply for positions. The state also has a job line. Um, as you see on the screen, it's 651-259-3637. And then there is an email, careers at state.mn.us. I'm gonna post that. That goes to a general recruiter. Um, I believe at MMB, um, and then they'll be able to answer your questions. But, you know, I, I went to the State Careers webpage uh, just yesterday as I was creating these slides. And, you know, if you've ever gone there, you go there and then there's this um, search engine. Um, on that page, you can search by a bunch of different categories. You can search by agency. If you really have your heart ha heart on a certain agency, you can um, search by job family. So if you um, are in information technology, or if you have a law background, or if you um, have a background in insurance and benefits, you know, you can go to those particular uh, job families and then search for everything within that. Um, and as of yesterday, there were, as you can see on the screen, 70 openings in facilities operation and maintenance careers, 40 openings in human services, um, 
30 in psychology and counseling, 15 in information technology. And even if you're a student worker, or if you have a, a young person in your life who's in college or you know, two year, four year degrees, um, they have internship openings and in student, student worker positions. And so this is the same area that that person would go to to find um, student worker opportunities. So for instance, um, just a few of the openings that I saw yesterday and today um, are licensed practical nurse, corrections agent, muscle survey monitoring intern. If you have a young person in college that is into biology, they can uh, survey muscles this summer. Um, a master plumber, law compliance rep, pharmacy contracts manager, safety and security program manager, student worker for, I believe that's in one of the colleges. So there really are a lot of openings. Now, one question that was coming through to me that last they had heard that many uh, state departments are on a hiring freeze. Um, I don't know if that has a officially changed, but I know that there's paperwork that if um, a manager has said that this is a critical position that needs to be hired or that needs to be filled, they can apply to whoever makes those decisions and then get approval to hire. So um, that's why there are a number of positions that are they're currently hiring. And for that same reason, you know, like DNR, um, like Paula was mentioning with the Forest Service, you know, they're hiring for the summer season coming up. Um, just quickly, resume writing tips, make sure that you keep your resume chronological and if possible, put the exact dates for your previous work that you've, you know, started and stopped. So if it were like uh, March 13th, uh, 1998 to April 25th, 2004, be sure to list those if you have that information. Um, really clearly state with those keywords how you meet minimum and preferred qualifications um, and try to avoid the experience-based resumes that lack a timeline for all of these positions. So just moving on, just to wrap this up, you know, when there's, there's so much more available for government jobs, um, I don't know if any of you have used this site, governmentjobs.com, but um, I'm typing it in right now. There you go. It's in the chat now. Oops, I've got it wrong. Uh, it's it's for all county, city, state jobs. Um, so go to that and you type in your personal uh, zip code or you know your your city that you're looking for, and it will give you all of the state and city um, opportunities. USAjobs.gov is another one, um, and it has so many opportunities, whether it's for scientific or administrative or law, um, medical, human resources, um, you know, for any of the federal opportunities. So take a look at that if you haven't already. Um, and I'd, I'd say again, use that those very specific keywords in information um, when applying to USA jobs as well as the state jobs. And then other sites, and I will send out all of this information to all of you who pre-registered. There's League of Minnesota Cities. Um, there's the Minnesota Judicial Branch. There's the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And again, the state of Minnesota. So there's so many different opportunities and different job um, search engines, I should say, that you could use. Again, Minnesota Works, I've mentioned this over the, the weeks. Um, you can type in Dakota County or whatever county you're in, St. Louis County, Cook County. And um, if the county has been using the National Labor Exchange, it will show up there too. Okay, so we're to the end of our session, I realize we're over. Um, but just to get this in right now, you should jump onto Metro Interactive Career Fair. And uh, a career fair in the metro area is taking place now until uh, five o'clock. 
I'm typing it into the chat now. Looks correct. Um, you do have to have a login, but I've created one for myself. It goes really pretty quickly. And a bunch of information will be over there, a bunch of recruiters, including a couple of other Department of Transportation um, recruiters and other things around the Twin Cities. Um, in the next couple weeks, you know, two weeks here, I will be holding Central Minnesota Virtual Career Affairs. Send me um, an email and I'll get you information about that. But we've got one Thursday morning um, and then again next week, uh, Tuesday. And all during the month of April, my Explore Careers will be around Technology Month. It's going to be really interesting. So please join us in April every Tuesday from 2.30 to 3.30. So um, I look forward to hearing from you. I'm just going to go straight to my contact information and take care. And I will see you next time.